just wanted to welcome you all here. I'm Julie Richard. I am the CEO of Sedona Art Center. And this is the third in the series of Appropriation in the Art Series. This is a long time coming. Um, but first, I want to thank uh, Bernadette Carroll, who is my COO, and Kelly Clemenko, who um, on my staff, who have really been leading the way for this um, in, in the third, all three, uh, Kelly's been recording them, and um, Bernadette's been helping coordinate. But I really want to acknowledge Claudine Taliak, who is with the Museum of Northern Arizona, who has just been doing the lion's share of all of the coordination of the, um, our speakers. So let's give all three of them a huge round of applause. This has really been a partnership, um, and we couldn't have done it without the Arizona Humanities Council for their financial support. That is really how um, we were able to pay for this. So let's give them a round of applause. And the first two discussions were moving from appropriation to authenticity and more than a meal. They are online at SedonaArtCenter.org. If you haven't watched them or if you weren't in attendance at those first two lectures, which were up at the museum, I encourage you to go to our website and, um, and look at those uh, lectures. They were really, really interesting. So I'm going to turn it over to Mary Kershaw who um, was really uh, instrumental in helping to put all of this together with me, and uh, she wants to say a few words, so Mary? Um, as Julie said, thank you for that introduction, Julie. Um, I am Mary Kershaw. I am the Executive Director and CEO of the Museum of Northern Arizona in Flagstaff. So, quick show of hands, how many of you have been to the Museum of Northern Arizona in Flagstaff? Yeah. Yes. Okay, awesome. <laughs> How many of you are members? Yay. <laughs> so the rest of you will soon be members, I'm sure. <laughs> so it's always good to take a straw poll. Thank you for that. It's a real pleasure to be here, as Julie said, in the third of a series of conversations about a really important topic everywhere, but particularly in our part of the world and for the communities who coexist here. And the first two have been very constructive and very open and honest, which I think is really important. So there's no pressure on the panel this time <laughs> to make sure we have the same. Um, <laughs> I do want to say also a program like this really stresses the importance of working together. This has been a really beneficial partnership between the Sedona Art Center and the Museum of Northern Arizona on a topic that is close to the hearts of both of us, but in very different ways. So I think it was a very, MNA was a very natural place for Julie to reach out to when she was making some inquiries about whether people had statements about cultural appropriation. And that initial phone call really is how this, this all began. And I say MNA was a natural place to reach out to because we're, we're almost 100 years old, and in our founding, in 1928, from that time onwards, MNA has worked very, close, it, very closely in collaboration and partnership with the Native communities on the Colorado Plateau. And so it is etched in our DNA, and something that we have always found to be very important is that Consultation, collaboration, and partnership. Hasn't always been perfect, but we've always endeavored on all sides to make it work really effectively. It's one of the most, I think, powerful things about MNA as an institution. So when Julie asked me, did we have a statement about cultural appropriation? Straight away I said, no, we don't have a statement. And it wasn't because it's not an important topic. It's because it's such an important topic that for us, it's part of our fundamental establishment. So it's not that we don't need a statement or we don't want a statement, but it hasn't risen to the top of a priority because it is who and what we do. So it was really nice to come together 
and look at how do we broaden that. Um, I was really delighted that Julie liked the idea when we talked about, rather than just working to come up with a statement or find one that someone else had, have a series of conversations where we could discuss these topics and work out what is it that is expected or required or demanded of cultural institutions now. And coming together to decide that, I think has been a really, really beneficial part of this process. I want to follow Julie's uh, shout out to staff with a special shout out, again to Claudine, because when we came up with the idea of let's have a series, let's have a conversation about this topic, I went to my team at MNA and they were all over it because this is kind of what we do. You know, we have these kind of convenings. Um, gave it to the program team, Claudine grasped it, and they came back to me, let's not just have a conversation, let's have a series of conversations. And so we broadened it out and applied to the Arizona Humanities for a grant. And as Julie said, they have funded this program, which is a, a token of how important they feel this is. So getting that grant was a huge accomplishment. And kudos to Claudine and the team and everyone who helped and contributed to that. I also want to give a shout out to Tony Thibodeau, who's moderating today and Kelly Hayes Gilpin, who is not here with us today, but who moderated the first two talks. Um, and they put a lot of work into making sure that these conversations are significant and meaningful um, and forward-looking. And I also want to say thank you to Julie. <laughs> it's great working with you. And to all our panelists today, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. Mary definitely touched on um, all of this, but it, it goes. This goes actually back to about two months after I arrived here in January of 2021, um, when one of my staff came to me. One of my gallery staff actually came to me and um, said there was a guest that came in the gallery. And after asking um, the staff a, a few questions about a particular artist's work, um, they declared the work cultural appropriation and turned on their heels and left. Needless to say, our staff was very upset by this, and um, mostly because if they were doing something wrong, they wanted to fix it. So we started discussing this, um, both at the staff level and at the board level, and we had several discussions about what we could do about it, and um, if anything, and what we should try to find out. So basically the board said, you know, Julie, why don't you see, why don't you do a little digging and see what you can find? So as Mary said, I called her, I called um, all kinds of other museums around the area, I called the National Endowment for the Arts because I had a um, contact there, Cliff Murphy, who was the Director of Folklife and Folklore at um, the National Endowment, and nobody had a policy. <laughs> Sorry. Are those okay. dogs? <laughs> That's a sea lioness. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and nobody had a policy or a statement on cultural appropriation. Um, it was really interesting. So I went back to Mary and I said, you know, I like what she said, would you like to partner on this? You know, we need to explore this further and see, you know, how people um, feel about this. What is the background? Um, and maybe come up with some kind of a joint statement when this is over. So that is kind of how all of this began. Mary said yes, and we began planning. And so we really hope this series helps all of us understand what can be done to understand the appropriation of indigenous art forms and culture and support native artists and entrepreneurs. It's an opportunity for all of us to be more mindful, ethical, and respectful allies and advocates. And again, we're so grateful um, to MNA for partnering with us on this, and um, I hope you enjoyed today's discussion. Oh, and one other thing. We have these coloring sheets. Um, Claudine actually approached an artist, and so we've had different coloring sheets 
and it's really an, a, a reflection sheet as well um, for you to pick up and take with you and um, just help you kind of think about what uh, we're discussing today. So I'm going to turn it over to Tony and um, we'll let you go. And I'm going to hand this over to Susan. It's on. Great. Thanks, Julie. <clears throat> So uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, welcome to this uh, to this uh, panel discussion. Uh, really looking forward to this discussion today, and happy to see such um, uh, such a good turnout today. So um, I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, of course, there's information about each of our panelists as well as myself in the program. So I'm not going to read everything, uh, but we'll start with Jason. Uh, Jason Garcia to my left here. Um, his work documents the ever-changing cultural landscape of his home of Capo Oinque, uh, which is Santa Clara Pueblo, also known as Santa Clara Pueblo in northern New Mexico. Um, Jason's Tewa cultural ceremonies, traditions, and stories, as well as 21st century popular culture, comic books, and technology influence his clay and his print work. Jason is also a master printmaker uh, with a degree from the University of Wisconsin, correct? Uh, and then uh, Susan Cleaver. Uh, Susan is one of the Southwest's most acclaimed contemporary sculptors, a painter since the age of 10. Susan turned to sculpting in 1987 after working in an art casting foundry for 10 years. So images of both uh, Jason and Susan's work up on the screen there. Okay. And then finally, uh, Antonio Chavarria. Uh, Tony, uh, also from Santa Clara Pueblo, um, um, Sorry. <laughs> Capo Winga. I always want to say, okay, Winga. Well, yeah, I know that is definitely not where you're from. Um, has over 30 years of experience collaborating with tribes and curating Native material and culture. As curator of ethnology at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe, he's curated many exhibitions of historic and contemporary Native art. So thank you all for coming today. Really enjoying having you here today. So now we've got the introductions um, out of the way. We're going to do a quick warm-up poll. We have a couple of questions for, um, for the audience, um, just to kind of gauge people's familiarity and their interest with this topic today. Um, of course, the, the discussion today will focus on indigenous and non-indigenous artists' use of cultural symbols, uh, the history of indigenous representation in art, and the dynamics between the dominant culture and, ind and indigenous artists who rely on their art for financial success. Um, so the poll questions, if you want to scan the QR code up here, that code is also in your program. If you want to scan it with your phone, it'll take you to the site where you can answer those questions. Uh, Claudine will be walking around to assist, um, and we'll just take a couple of minutes to do that poll. Does it seem to be working for people? Good. We just tap it. If you just zoom in over that QR code, you should be able to get a web a website. Yeah, if you just use your your camera on your phone and zoom in on the QR code, either in your program or on the screen, it will take you to those questions. Western, Southwestern art in general is respectful of indigenous peoples and helps to promote positive aspects of their cultures. Somewhat agree, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree. It's confusing because who's Southwestern art? I mean, tribal art? You can interpret that however you wish. Modern, you know, sure. Yes, granted it is a large general category, and that is intentional. <clears throat> this is the second question. Cultural appropriation in art is acceptable as long as the artist understands and appreciates indigenous culture. Looks like we have a pretty even split there. Well, um, I'm gonna move on. Um, I wanted to, to, because this is the last panel in the series, 
I don't know how many people uh, attended the first series or watched the videos, but I thought it would be worth a very, very brief recap of what we covered in those panels, just so you understand kind of like where we've come so far. The first panel um, in the series uh, really focused on um, blatantly fraudulent native art in the marketplace on a global scale. And this um, relates to federal uh, legislation, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act of 1990, which a lot of people aren't familiar with this legislation, but it actually protects both consumers and native artists um, about what, you know, especially jewelry, a lot of jewelry, that is fraudulently made and labeled as native made, but it's made in Pakistan or Indonesia or someplace like that. And so obviously um, this impacts legitimate native artists in terms of their livelihood, um, but the marketplace has been, become flooded with this type of material in the last I'd say 20, 25 years or so. And so the Indian Arts and, and, and Crafts Act really addresses that illegal market for counterf counterfeit native art. Um, and really what we addressed in that, in that uh, panel was how this is not a victim victimless crime, right? If you buy a piece of jewelry, and they say that it's native made, but it's not, well, who's to, you know, who's hurt? Well, the actual, you know, the native artists who are relying on that economic ink, that, that stream for their economic um, um, stability, that's who it affects. And so um, there was a lot of details about the, uh, about the, the, the legislation. I urge you to go watch, watch the panel. It's very, it's fascinating. Uh, it's on the Sedona Art Center um, YouTube channel. Um, the second uh, panel in the series uh, was called More Than a Meal. And the main theme of that uh, panel was food sovereignty and indigenous foods and who, who has the right to use these foods and these uh, recipes, um, because of course, as Tony pointed out to me on the way down, you can't copyright an ingredient or a recipe even, right? And so that's a, it's a very different kind of um, cultural appropriation, uh, but again, also has impacts on, um, especially indigenous people who are trying to bring back some of their traditional um, food ways. Um, so again, not a victimless crime, uh, but not really even a crime, but also, you know, uh, trends in the marketplace, trends in cooking um, have an effect on that access that um, indigenous cooks and chefs um, need for, for their own survival. So um, what I saw as a common theme in the first two panels uh, when talking about cultural appropriation is to focus on the power dynamic or the power differential between the two cultures the, um, and to see, you know, if there's a big differential in that, that power dynamic, that's when it becomes something that maybe should be questioned. Um, so that's something to kind of keep in mind in any case of potential cultural appropriation. But I wanted to dial it back a little bit just to talk about appropriation in the arts. Of course, that's the name of the series and I kind of was interested, like what's the history you know, of appropriation in the arts? And of course, we're talking, really, we're talking about two forms of, of, of appropriation here. Artistic appropriation and cultural appropriation. Uh, there's lots of other forms of appropriation, religious appropriation, um, that are related to cultural appropriation. Um, but in the arts, appropriation um, is a form of adoption, right? Appropriation is typically the use of pre-existing objects or images with little or no transformation applied to them. Um, use of appropriation in the arts has a long history um, in literary arts, visual arts, performing arts. Um, in the visual arts, typically to appropriate something means to adopt, borrow, or recycle, or sample elements, or entire forms of human-made culture. So an example of this would be, say, Andy Warhol's uh, Campbell Soup Can. Uh, uh, can. I'm sure everybody's familiar with that, right? Andy Warhol did not invent the Campbell's Soup Can, but he appropriated that image for his own artwork to interpret in a different way. Um, appropriation, um, similar to found object art, is, uh, this is a quote from the MoMA Glossary of Art Terms, an artistic strategy, the intentional borrowing, copying, and alteration of pre-existing images, objects, and ideas. Now, I see cultural appropriation as typically broader than artistic appropriation. Artistic appropriation, I think, is a form of cultural appropriation, but it's essentially the borrowing of cultural elements, removing them, and reusing them outside of their original context. This is a process that could be consensual or non-consensual, right? 
and, and you're, this is where the power dynamic and power differential kind of factors in. Um, and finally, before we move on to questions with the panelists, I wanted to talk about a form, I think a, a concept that relates to cultural appropriation is a, a form of collective nostalgia. Nostalgia very much, I think, is a, is a very powerful force that drives a lot of cultural appropriation. And um, anthropologist Renato Rinaldo um, came up with this concept of imperialistic or imperialist nostalgia, which is the imagined perception of colonized cultures, often with the paradoxical feeling of regret for what has been destroyed by, by the colonizer. So this type of nostalgia has led to stereotypes of indigenous people, such as the noble savage, stereotypes that you're probably familiar with, um, and efforts to basically save that which has been destroyed, right? Which is sort of counterintuitive. But we see this, you know, going back, back to the turn of the last century of people seeing the cultures that have been destroyed through colonization and trying to find ways, you know, sometimes with very good intentions, but to, to save those cultures. A lot of museums in the Southwest have their roots in trying to preserve those indigenous cultures, right? So um, I think this continues to this day um, with different forms of cultural appreciation, or <laughs> cultural appropriation. We'll talk about appreciation too. Um, okay, so let's move on to questions for um, the panelists. Um, and the first one I have is a, is a very, um, very kind of broad question, but what are we talking about when we're talking about indigenous art? What does that mean? What does it mean? What does indigenous or native art mean? Um, and any one of you guys can start. I'll let my elder Tony start. <laughs> Tony? Yeah, I guess uh, so indigenous art, but I think I seem to paint with broad strokes, if we will. It's basically, you know, art that is made um, you know, by indigenous peoples, you know, in the broadest term. Um, then to get a little more um, uh, nuanced, um, is art made um, by indigenous people within and a cultural context, if you will, as well. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean using strictly um, or uh, with a native um, a subject matter or iconography or such too, but basically coming from, uh, well, like a sense of a cultural lens, basically how that um, cultural lens and it can have you interpret, you know, other types of art. You know, whether if you're going to be using something that we use as a quote unquote traditional, whether that's ceramics or not, but you know, but also that that type of the art, like is are you using the traditional types of you know clays, whatnot too? Are you using commercials? Are you doing new methods of firing, whatnot? But you know how that is um, how your own, I guess, uh, relationship and upbringing, you know, with your in a sense indigenous culture, in, uh, influences that you know, in a sense. I guess so. Just for for a, a quick taste version of what is indigenous art. Well, I think he really said it all, but um, it can go way back to ancestors, and that's really worth preserving. And um, it's in every every uh, family of indigenous people. There's uh, always someone who wants to do the art to keep it going and preserve the, the traditions of their, their culture. And, uh, and I think it's wonderful. Um, it's <laughs> a lot more than a lot of us Anglos have, you know. We have different, uh, we have different uh, cultures where we came from, but we kind of lost it along the way a lot of times. So I'm really proud of these people that uh, keep their arts and indigenous ideas going through the generations. Jay? Um, just adding to what Tony said of, of, you know, the indigenous art made by the indigenous peoples, and then also <clears throat> trying to define what is art exactly. Is it the, uh, is it the craft? Is it the art? Is it in the museum? Is it uh, something you're creating for, um, utilitarian use and then also how does that de definition become from or changing from utilitarian use to being in a museum in the Metropolitan Museum of Art and selling for millions of dollars or um, also materials what it's made from those are some of those things that 
that are attached to it, and then also the culture that creates it, and uh, a lot of meaning behind it, whether it's a utilitarian or, or uh, designs on the actual piece of work and how that becomes um, quote unquote indigenous. And then also what is the uh, meaning of indigenous of it being like um, uh, natural in its natural state? Um, like how do you define all of that as well too? Or, um, or being you know, raw in that sense. But again, it's also coming from a colonized mindset of saying like, you guys are backwards because you don't have technology, you don't have certain tools that are stone age primitive, you know, that's also part of it as well too. So it, it, it has a lot of various different definitions. And then also um, in regards to appropriation, you know, stealing, taking, borrowing, adopting, culturation. There's so many ways of, of carrying it. And I think those are some of the things that we're kind of talking about as far as some Tony's notes and everything too, so. Jason, as a, as a native artist, I wanted to ask you specifically, how do you walk that line between seeing yourself as simply a, a contemporary artist mm -hmm. or defining yourself as an indigenous artist? Do you, do you kind of skew one way or the other, or do you find that a hard balance? Uh, I don't know if it's like a hard balance. It's just who I am. That's my identity, you know. Um, I'm an artist. I'm Santa Clara. I'm Tewa. I'm Jason. I'm Old Kupin. Uh You know, I have this badge, this W on my chest that says I went to University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm a hardcore badger. Um, <laughs> I do an alum also. And I guess there's a couple badgers that I also met in the room as well too, so all Wisconsin. Um, you know, so there's those identities of, of that and also that of myself of appropriating the fact that that and that's who I've become and that's who I am. And, um, you know, and again, being Tewa and being Santa Clara, you know, we have our own distinctive identity, which is also different from each of the other six Tewa Pueblos in New Mexico. And then also the um, Tewa group that's at First Mesa and Hopi, you know, we have connections and, and but we also have differences as, as well too that separate us over over time as well too. Um, so there's like really like a really hard, like there is no high, hard line I always, or this is for myself, Jason, you know, it's just like this blend, you know, it's just something that doesn't necessarily detach, it's like concrete, you know, all these ingredients have made me who I am and you can never go back to water, concrete mix, sand, all those ingredients. It's a cake, you know, you can't break it back to, you can't take it back to an egg, you can't take it back to flour, you can't take it back to water, oil. You know, it's just, it's already concrete, you know, it's made. So it's really hard to say that of the, of the line of how do you define artist, fine artist, contemporary artist. It also depends on the meaning of what I'm creating also as well too. Whether it is like utilitarian or if it's a cultural item or if it's something made specifically that I've been commissioned to make for a museum. So, you know, there's always those hard, hard um, ways. How do you define it? It's always those things that you're always asking yourself that right. too. I just wanted to say that I think uh, Jason also brought up a very um, interesting point as well that um, now actually how you define art, you know, in a sense, in terms of indigenous art, because, because many of the communities, you know, certainly in the pueblos as well, that there actually isn't a word for that you know, for art and traditional language. So if you're coming at it really from a strong cultural point, you know, that then, you know, it's really, it's, it just goes from the outside, you know, that as an artist, you know, that's an outside thing. And then and then today too, and especially in today's, you know, the market all as well, then you are, you know, become like this artist. But I think that's also goes back to this root. So sometimes where this area about appropriation can be sometimes contentious is because that it's so tied to culture, because that there wasn't like this a kind of like split, you know, where you know, like the art was like separate from it was a separate like occupation, and then even in terms of indigenous as well, um, it's like um, uh, I think when back when the, the young um, um, a lady who won the uh, Academy Award for I think it's a whale runner, um, or well runner or whale rider was that whale rider whale rider um, they're saying you know she's the first indigenous woman to win an Academy Award, but I was thinking um, but 
I think the year before, Catherine Zeta-Jones won for Zora or something, like that. Um, and, I th and I believe she's Welsh, and I says, and so are, are Welsh indigenous as well? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's not, what it made me think too, it's like, I don't think even Welsh would consider themselves Anglo, right, correct? No, <laughs> because they're so, Welsh. Yeah. And so it's like- It says Irish, don't it? Exactly. It sells Anglo they're for not Anglo either. Reasons. No, because they're not, they weren't, those anti Anglos as the colonizers in a sense, yeah. So, it's just like if you go and you go to Wales, you know, the signs are all going to be in Welsh mm -hmm. as well with the English under it. You know, it's because they still like maintain that identity. Because mm -hmm. I think it's like here, well, sometimes people like there's a kickback to a, um, you know, like our changing like so place names, things like that as well. You know, that's already happened as well. You know, it's, it's just, this is just, it's just finally like occurring here in this place. Thanks, Tony. Why don't I throw the second question out here about, you know, with the struggling a little bit, I think sometimes with the definition of appropriation, a lot of interpretation about what people mean by appropriation. So I'd like to invite each of you to, to define, you know, what is your own personal definition of what appropriation is, both in a broad sense, but already, but also in the context of indigenous art and culture. Susan? The dictionary says that to take something for one's own use, whether you have permission or not. It was kind of sketchy about that. And um, it's it's a two-way street. It's a hard thing to, to define, really. Um, I don't think you should use anybody else's images unless you ask them first. Uh, I know painters never would take say a, a landscape out of Arizona highways and paint it, I mean, you shouldn't do that. And, uh, sculptors also uh, should have a model and it should come from their heart and not copy somebody else because that happens a lot. Somebody sent me a clipping once from a newspaper in Albuquerque and some artist had used one of my sculptures and enlarged it for a, a big piece downtown Albuquerque and uh, their response when I called the, the, the it was a board that had uh, chosen him and they said oh no he made them Hispanic kids not Navajo kids oh, no. <laughs> so I guess they thought that was okay but everything about it was the same there was even a dog running along the side of the burrow I mean Susan, so you could just point the mic Okay, the other way. Too, no, oh, too loud? Yeah, okay. no, no, right. Uh, oh, anyway, I have different views on it. I think um, I get really upset about uh, Anglo people doing Native people all like muscle men, like bodybuilders, because they don't really look like that. And most of the time, and especially in the old days, they were hungry. Um, so there's things that bother me about artists and what they use sometimes. I try to be really authentic as much as I can, and I'll talk more about that later. Uh, uh, that's it. Jason. Yeah, appropriation definition of, that of, you know, you do have your, um, Webster's Dictionary definition of it. And, um, you know, for artists, you know, artists don't steal, they appropriate. Um, and that's, we were talking about that on the drive down, of, of that's something that's been happening since time immemorial, since the uh, cave drawings in Lasca or whatever the place is, wherever it's pronounced, or, um, you know, sometimes uh, talking with other artists, you know, there where people say like, wow, you, created such a great idea or did you are you the first person like you have to be the first native person to have put gold paint on ceramics and they're like uh no you know <laughs> or designs are saying like wow this is amazing and it's like oh yeah the greeks are doing it you know um so it, it's really hard to define that in in terms of art you know but i think then that then there comes into the question of the cultural appropriation you know, because you know we're we're all influenced again, like I said, by our our own interactions, our own history. You know, or even sometimes you know, appropriation and stealing can be the same thing. And uh, you know, for artists, it's very hard to because uh, you know you think of uh, George Harrison, 
you know, my, oh, my, my what is it, my, my Lord, sweet, my, sweet Lord. My, my sweet Lord, that you know, there's the uh, um, be my baby song. And he's, he's uh, what time? Sorry. Oh yeah, he's so fine. I'm sorry. I'm thinking of uh, uh, the Wilson. Uh, Brian Wilson also had the same thing. Had issues with that, and um, you know, there's that memory of a song that's in their head. They write something, but then another artist says, "Hey, you stole that from me." They go to court. Sometimes they prove it. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes it's just art. It's just the identity. It's just again what we hear. But then you have other artists like um, is it Dan Fogarty, you know, and it's like "Run to the River." Or I think that's what the song is called. Or "Run to Run the, to the jungle. Run to the Jungle," and then he has this song, and someone's suing him. But then, and they're saying use or the other eagles are yeah, suing they him because they said of, uh, ripping off himself. Yeah, so you know, then that comes up too. So you know, where he wrote a song when he was in the Eagles, ten years later he writes it as a solo artist. His fellow musicians are suing him and say, how can I sue my own self? <laughs> so again, it's really hard. It's really hard to to prove some of these things, you know. And, but then when the cultural side comes into it, then that kind of changes things. Um, so I will talk more about that. It's huge. It's <laughs> Jason, I think you brought up a good point. When, you know, we're all, when, when we're getting into lawsuits and things like that, when, you're, when money comes into it, that's when, you know, then people, because if, if any of those songs weren't hits, mm -hmm. nobody would yeah. care, yeah. right? Um, and the, you know, appropriation in music happens. It's been happening for years. You know, early in early hip hop, you know, people were sampling for records all over the place and not getting those cleared. They were not getting permission to use those samples. Um, and now, the nowadays, you have to get those cleared. But back in back in the early days, like people weren't getting those samples cleared. And I think a lot of people, you know, agree now in retrospect that that was like a creative use of existing cultural elements. Tony, did you have a chance to, to, to oh. talk about appropriation? And just I think you know, we pretty much got it. Mm -hmm. um, just with it thinks, yeah. So we, but I think you know, it's, it's really different kind of what we're talking about because there are those legal protections, you know, like copyright laws, trademark mm -hmm. laws, etc. But then when you get into areas of like certainly of art and culture, then that's when it becomes a bunch of more nebulous mm -hmm. as well. I mean, because now there's been a big thing in the news recently, you know, uh, about you know. Uh, Bring copyright to the forefront again is because of uh, the Steve O'Willie, the first interview you know, Mickey Mouse now entering the oh, public yeah. domain, you know, as well. And then you're, you're talking about it now is that it's pretty close um, for like was it another 12 something years mm -hmm. that the earliest versions of Superman, Batman, etc., are going to enter the public domain as well. Um, that you, and, but the thing is that you can't put out your own Batman comic, we can't call it Batman because then that's trademark, things like that. Just like the S shield insignia is trademark, which is different than from a copyright. So there's all these things that come up, but then when you get into what we're talking about here, like on maybe either native iconography or something like that too, but then that's different. You know, so many things that falls more under like, what is what is intellectual property? You know, what is appropriation? What is cultural or art appropriation? Um, the next question has to do with representation and indigenous representation in art. And I was wondering if you guys could share some of your thoughts on the history of indigenous representation in the art world. Tony, you made eye contact with me first. <laughs> Okay, we know how that goes. <laughs> so, in, in, um, indigenous representation in art. Yeah. In art, yeah. Okay, well, um, I guess yeah, you can take it back to like the earliest um, painting descriptions of uh, the pics <laughs> and some of the other by Roman art and whatnot too. And uh, basically, uh, anyone who uh, wasn't civilized like they were, you know, then them uh, until they're like going through Europe and civilizing people as they saw it or whatnot. But um, and then certainly, and I can hear uh, that you know you get these different eras of uh, native represent, you know, native or indigenous representation of people in, in in art, if you want to call it Western art. Um, you know, starting back, you know, in the the, the uh, earlier, um, you see, even you could even say that um, the this mean, the temp, the temp, tempest, um, the Shakespeare's last play is actually native representation. You know, and if you want to call it a play that actually that because it's, it's like influenced by the. The, the discoveries now coming out of what they consider the new world. Um, and then some of those earliest paintings and such not, 
that are showing starting to show up as well. But then what we're really trying to focusing on is like certainly in the uh, Western period, you know, with the uh, uh, like post Civil War or whatnot, and even the expansion of what was the United States, you know, coming into um, the, you know, these areas, you know, what was formerly you know parts of you know either France or Mexico, and which was always still had the native people that were still here. Um, that is a, the, like, one thing too, like when you just talk about, uh, especially in this region, that they had already these established systems of government and such too, that, that uh, one thing like is kind of like a little less known is that um, certainly like for uh, like a lot of Pueblo governments, that there was this uh, issue back in the 1800s is that the people are saying, well, you know, they're not really Indians because they had, they, they're farmers, and they like had permanent houses and such. And so, um, that they really don't, which really they don't belong under the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and then, which was under the Department of War at the time as well. <laughs> so that's it, because, you know, um, and you know, they already had existing treaties with Spain, which then came under default under Mexico, which then defaulted under the United States. And so, so then they didn't, weren't sure what to do with the Pueblos. So they were out of the Bureau for a while until they realized that there was nowhere else for them to go. Because then, then they started like well, getting the land loss because of, well, they weren't getting protections as well. The things were under trust and whatnot. So then they went back under the Bureau. Um, and so then you get this, these things like that that are happening. That um, so then I think maybe that movie also kind of relates to, like to uh, as you mentioned that imperialist like nostalgia yeah. whatnot too. So that um, that that's what even like what has happened. So you, know, so you get this thing happening, this salvage anthropology happening. In like the 1870s, in 1879, Stevenson's coming out, and they're just collecting stuff. They're collecting stuff, and it goes into the early 20th century because they're saying these people are going to be gone. They're going to be gone in 20 years. They're going to be gone in 20 years. Um, it's like a, and it was always like this this 20 year thing. You know, so it was always being pushed back. You know, like, they're gone in 20 years. They're gone in 20 years. It was like the two week thing back in the last election. It was like two weeks, two weeks, but, um, but. Uh, the, uh, this was always, you know, they're, they're disappearing, they're disappearing. And so then, then you started getting all these, uh, like, uh, other types of expansions, you know, people coming out and painting all these things, like what it was, like, you know, like even earlier with Catlin, you know, yeah, as well. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, um, you know, then the, you got the guys like Remington, Russell, things like that as well. Um, where they're, they're, but the thing is, that it's a little different, is that they're in that era. You know, certainly uh, they have, there's a cultural shift, you know, particularly among the plains, which, which everyone is like, the, that's kind of like the dominant thing. It's like, because that was the end of that cultural thing. But as for example, for the, for the groups around here, it just continued, it just continued. <laughs> I mean, they were living, they were farmers, and they were still farmers. Um, it's just that, I remember when the depression hit in New Mexico, that like really nothing changed because um, uh, something like 90% 90, 90 of the population was in a economically depressed state already. <laughs> so it was just like, oh, well everyone's like us now. So. <laughs> so that, I mean, I, I'm kind of like really going, uh, 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 I'm taking the wide U-turn to get back to the thing. But anyway, but yeah, that um, just to say that it's just it's like it's always been there and it's always been this process that's been tied to um, like um, like both like the, the salvage anthropology in a sense, but you can even call this call, like, like even this like salvage, you know, art representation as well. Mm -hmm. That it's like trying, trying to like capture something that they felt was either gone or disappearing. So, Next one. Mm -hmm. Susan? Well, in some cases it has, especially on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. um, but I think people like George Catlin, uh, he was here, oh, 1836 or so. And uh, he, was, he wanted to record the people that were here and their customs and their clothing and their headdresses and all that. And nobody really objected to that. In fact, there's an artist living in Prescott now, John Coleman, some of you know him, really good sculptor and painter. Um, he's taken um, Catlin's paintings or, and made them into sculptures. And they're beautiful. And he did them just, he used the paintings uh, to get everything perfect in his sculptures. And you could see them down at a museum in uh, Scottsdale, the Western Art Museum. So I think a lot of this is valuable to, to keep the traditions and the, the people so we don't forget. Not that everybody's going away, especially the Pueblo people, but um, 
Yeah, I, I, it's, uh, it's hard because you don't want people to take away from people that have their own symbols and their own art and all that. But at the same time, sometimes it's good for somebody to come along. Uh, even Edward Curtis with his photographs. I mean, he worked like crazy to get all the tribes photographed. And he, he must have asked their permission because he, he posed them sometimes. And um, so it, it's, it's hard. It's a hard question, I think. Mm -hmm. It really is. Jason? Thoughts about representation? <clears throat> yeah, I think early representations of Native peoples was pretty much part of the manifest destiny as far as, you know, the westward expansion across America. Yeah. And then also in regards to, I think like Catlin and those other painters, you know, you're documenting what you're destroying or what yeah. will no longer be there. And then also thinking about the uh, vanishing race of Curtis, Edward of Sheriff Curtis, who's also from Wisconsin as well. Um, and his ideas, I mean, sometimes you have to think about that colonialism, colonialist, um, settler colonialism that's taking place at that time. And again, the vanishing races, I'm documenting this because these people are no longer going to be there. And, uh, you know, let's not forget them. Let's um, document them before they're gone, just like Tony said with the salvage um, ideas. And, um, you know, then there's also that other part that the thought of, like, um, we have to document them before we, they go, before they're gone. But we haven't gone anywhere. We're still here. It's 2023. And, uh, you know, we've been here. Or 2024, excuse me. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm vanishing. <laughs> and, um, you know, we're still here. Um, we're not going anywhere. We still maintain our tribal lands, like Tony said. Uh, we're still maintaining our languages, our cultures, uh, despite colonialism over the past 500 plus years of Spanish, Mexican governments, US governments. And I always say this in my talk of, you know, we've, we've, we've gone through, you know, three different colonizers. So who's next, you know, after USA? And, you know, because they, they haven't been alone very, you know, what is it, 200 and 200 plus years, yeah, you know. Yeah. Longer under Spain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, we've, we've learned to navigate various government systems and assert our identities, assert our land bases, assert our cultures. So, you know, again, like I said, we're not going anywhere. So, um, so it's just interesting to see how, how Natives are represented in art by a non-Native audience. Thanks. So uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip to a couple of questions further down. Um, I want to get into this question of the boundary between appreciation and appropriation. And where do you guys see where that line is? Uh, obviously, it's probably pretty blurry. Uh, but what do you see as the distinct differences between appreciation in the creation of art, using other cultural symbols um, and imagery or appropriation. John? I'll just do a quick one. Sure. I'll start with this um, uh, quote from the late great um, uh, comic artist Wally Wood, who said, um, never draw anything you can copy, never copy anything you can trace, never trace anything you can cut up and paste. <laughs> um, but <laughs> to get away from that, very um, cynical, <laughs> but that um, so usually what we say we have these really kind of like loose, um, tenuous um, definitions of you know, appropriation and appreciation. You know what, and what is that boundary? You know, and I think that is, and it, it really is. You know, the one there's there's definitely legal boundaries, and as we mentioned, we were talking about before that. You know, it's interesting. You can't copyright recipes, and just like you can't copyright like fashion designs as well because like the current laws have defined those as being too basic, you know, that they're basic, in a sense, human needs, you know, um, uh, wear, uh, clothing and food. Um, so that's, you know, that this is more like common back like when the Oscars were, uh, I think when it happened like in, was it April? Like, well, like March or April? And then there would always be like these things, you know, the knockoffs, you, know, you, can, you can wear their dress, you know, at your prom or whatever or whatnot, um, because they're more copyrighted, so that you could just like basically just make an exact copy of that. 
Um, so there's, but there are other things like protections, like you know, copyright laws, whatever too. But then when you get into things like with the, especially like with the culture indigenous or indigenous representation, it becomes much more um, tenuous. Becomes much more almost even almost an individual um, a choice um, as, as well. And you know, and it really um, can also impact you know all the you know the artists. I think also what, basically what, it's, but it can impact um, people's you know in a sense livelihood. Is that's when it, then it can become much more. Um, either like controversial or people you know, that can, you know, it becomes a creator of a harder discussion. You know, what what is this? Um, where where is the where are those lines? As like as Jason says that that um, you know you can't um, go back. You know, break things back down. Just like you you can't copyright a triangle. You know, um, we have these things like too where if someone is to see a, a design on a pot. You know, like a, and then you decide to make some product from that. You know, where where is that? You know, can that, you know, and then, then also the, or if someone from another, even like from another oh, village is like, oh, I'm gonna like make this, this hopey looking pot right now. Um, you know, where, what is that? Um, because we see that even um, in a, there's this uh, folk art market that they have in Santa Fe every year. And you'll see these uh, artists like from Peru and Ecuador, and they're oh. obviously using Southwest imagery on their pieces, on these oh. award pieces. And it's like, so yeah, so where, you know, what is, it, what is that line? Um, is it, is it appreciation? Is it appropriation? You know, you know, where where is that? I guess the market has okay. the market has not that specific market, but the marketplace has a lot to do with that. Susan, well, speaking for myself, um, I've always loved the West and the people in the West. I do cowboys. And I do Indians. All my Indian friends call themselves Indians. So excuse me, I'm not saying Native Americans all the time. But um, I ran a trading post for five years up at Marble Canyon in the 70s, and people still wore the traditional clothes, the women did, and, and the men wore cowboy outfits, really. But um, I love those people, and they uh, eventually uh, became really good friends, and they started calling me Shema, which means mom in, <laughs> in Navajo. Or sometimes Degis Peliana, which means crazy white woman. But um, <laughs> anyway, um, I don't feel. I mean, I have the background, so I feel like I can, I can show the world. In fact, I just did a little series of small pieces that were turn of the century Navajos, and um, just old men shaking hands and things like that just so people can remember um, what times were like back then. And my friend Kate, who's here today, my Hopi friend, um, she's been great to me and I get to go up to her mom's house and sit on her uncle's roof and watch the dances. And so I've been part of that too in a small way, but I love the Hopi culture. And I just try to do everything as authentically as I can. And so I don't feel like I, appropriating anything that much because I kind of lived it. Um, I don't have an answer for any of you, but um, I do make a living on it, but at the same time, I feel like I'm contributing. And a lot of Navajo friends used to come in the gallery when I was sculpting at Mountain Trails a lot, and they'd say, oh, thank you. Thank you for doing this for our people. So that was a real compliment. Thanks, Susan. Jay? I think the boundary <clears throat> is probably the dollar sign. And the power dynamic is that. And taking <laughs> taking from, from people, taking cultural knowledge, symbols, and making it your own, but then not contributing back into the communities that you're taking the art from, or the culture from, or the symbols from, or the materials that you're taking. I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, you know, I think for a native, most native artists, I won't say all, but uh, maybe I should even say some, you know, in terms of like, um, you know, using <laughs> cultural images, language, um, symbols, ingredients, recipes, fashion, symbols, um, how are you contributing back to your community by either teaching, sharing your knowledge, 
sharing language, teaching, um, working in the community, I think that's also part of it. Uh, then also, how are you contributing monetarily as well too, you know? Um, are you paying your models? Are you paying them well enough that, you know, you're, you're using their, their name image likeness as we, <laughs> you know, that's a new thing in college sports as well too, you know? Uh, where people, that, that power dynamic is shifting also, it just shifted this past year and all that with those things. So, you know, where college students aren't necessarily being taken advantage, but in some ways they still are. Um, so, you know, is, are you doing that to the native indigenous community that you're appropriating from? And I always use uh, quotations when I say some of those things like traditional or contemporary traditional Santa Clara Pueblo pottery. <laughs> and, and, you know, appropriation is again, how, how are you contributing back to the community you're using? So again, those are those power dynamics, the boundaries of, of that. And, um, you know, also um, trading, you know, of, of working with galleries and having a family that's been working with non-Indian traders, galleries, institutions, etc., over the past, you know, generations. That's probably the easiest thing rather than saying years. And how are you taking advantage or, or still continuing to take being taken advantage or how are you contributing to one another of, you know, 50-50% split, 70-30, 90-10, how are you working together? Um, you know, there's, there's all of those things. So I think that's really a lot of those boundaries and, and that power dynamic shifting of like, are you, is the person being taken advantage? And then again, the permission part of it, are you asking the permission? Are you required to take permission? And, um, and that happens also culturally as well too. Uh, even for my own self of, of having native organizations uh, use my work, <coughs> appropriating my work for, for banners and things like that, but the fact that they were native, like, uh, they should have asked my permission. They did not have my consent to borrow it. Um, so, you know, again, those things aren't just automatic of saying, like, oh, well, I'm native, we're native, you know, we should love one another, but, you know, there's that, the permission, and then also your compensation as part of that as well, too. So, you know, again, lots of boundaries, lots of lines, you know, lots of power dynamics. <laughs> I think those lines are shifting depending mm -hmm. on on the context, mm -hmm. right? Um, let's move on uh, to the next question. I know we're at three o'clock, but if everybody's cool with that, we're just gonna keep going because I think we're having an interesting conversation here. So, um, what role does an artist's heritage play in terms of the use of cultural symbols and depictions of life ways in art? So this comes down to the artist's personal heritage, and what role does that play? Tell me. <laughs> I just say a whole hell of a lot. <laughs> um, I'll do you know, just for example, um, I've been, did some, a, a little bit of work with these other anthropologists who are mostly working on this issue of shamanism and it being appropriated, and also, like, again, well, I guess I'm in the area for that, um, the new age of, of adherence yeah. as well. Um, and I was just saying, I said, well, just explain, well, because you know, it also happens, you know, with the other, you know, the North American Native peoples as well, or you know, people like the, well, there's that thing here, you know, this, I brought that example up, the sweat lodges, things like that, where um, that, I said, it's maybe, it may be a tantamount for me um, attending a um, Eastern Orthodox ceremony, like if I was in like Russia or something, and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And then I would make my own homemade um, vestments as well. And I would start doing um, um, uh, quote unquote baptisms and officiating marriages and such like that as well. And not here without having any like cultural context about what it really was about. But it, but but I, I but I really appreciate it. You know, really appreciated what I saw. And I thought it was beautiful. So I wanted to spread that. You know, so is that really doing that? You know, is that, is that really uh, the, showing the respect? You know, as well. But um, so I think when it first when it comes to um, with the native um, sense material in a. a um, because it, depending on you know what from area you're from or tribe or whatnot, that, that there are certain like iconography and things that are represented that are very very culturally specific, and then if you can get down even deeper, even like if you want to use that term, the ceremonial specific, and sometimes the things that are you know not to be meant or used out of context, 
And it's also goes through a different like, some point, uh, difference of worldview that there's not this scene, this thing as a this inherent uh, right to knowledge in many of uh, um, particularly in Pueblo and communities because that you have to earn that. You have to go through certain stages, you know, either you know as you age, you know, if you want to call it initiations or whatever, but that you basically and it just teachings, you know, it can and also experiences that you have to earn the room to be able to, to handle this knowledge. That is not something to be um, uh, just to be out there because it could have ramifications for your physical, for your physical, spiritual, and mental health. So that, that that's why there's responsibility to that knowledge. So that's one way I think that you know that there's an that's something that uh, oftentimes people don't realize that because of that cultural context. Right. Susan. I did a sculpture of, um, actually my friend Kate, who's here today, and um, she gave me a photograph that her dad had taken of her at the butterfly girl ceremony. And um, I couldn't go there and take photographs, you know, it's not, it's not permitted. But um, I was working out in the gallery and a, a nice Hopi man came in and he said, well, she's a butterfly girl, How's, how come there's no butterflies? So he, I said, well, I didn't want to do any without making sure they were Hopi style butterflies. <laughs> so he went home and drew me butterflies and sent them to me. And I used them all around the base of the piece. And then I felt good about the whole piece. And uh, I don't feel like I broke any rules, really. Uh, <laughs> so that's kind of what, uh, how I feel about it all. But. Um, I know it, it's it's a difficult in between thing. So, Jim, um, just uh, just probably um, just agree with Tony in terms of ditto of, of you know having certain um, knowledge and the ability to create certain things or having that right or you know, being part of the community that you know what is culturally sensitive and insensitive, I guess, in that sense. So I think those those are some of those things of, 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 our, of having that cultural knowledge of being able to know what you can or cannot create in that sense, or even knowledge of sharing too, you know, of that even we, within our own communities, you know, we have um, certain knowledge that we share amongst other community members, or we have, we don't even have that right to understand um, any of those things because we're not part of, you know, a certain group or a certain society or, or however, or we might not have that knowledge allowed to us. Even gender has part of that to do with too. Um, uh, so, you know, there's things as a table man that I don't know or I will never have the knowledge of that maybe my mothers or aunts or, you know, ceremonial mothers type things have, have knowledge of. So, uh, so again, that has a huge, huge role in, in, in what you create and how you share. Can we just real quick? Sure. Um, I guess, you know, like one of the most big examples of appropriation of, a, you know, if you want to call it a native symbol, to look at the um, uh, swastika. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, so when the the, the, the National Socialists, um, you know, appropriated that image, you know, because one of the one thing they're saying is that yeah, it came from, um, you know, uh, you know, in the uh, in just you know, the civilization, you know, in the Indian continent as well, um, from the Aryan groups there, <laughs> but also, um, but also, there's a, there's a probably also seen on Native American imagery when they saw American Indians because, you know, of the Carl May as well. Because before, you know, the 30s, the swastika, especially in this country, was seen as an Indian symbol. Yes. That basically, it was, is it, and if you wanted to show something that this is Indian, was when you could use a swastika, an arrowhead, you know, things like that, or a thunderbird. <laughs> Those were like all come across the board. You can you could buy silver spoons with a swastika at the bottom. You get you know what's called the whirling log symbol, you know, on both of them. <coughs> then you would see it on any textiles as well. Um, 
And then oftentimes they were reversed as well. You know, it's going in the other direction as the, the Nazi version. So, so, the end, so then that's you know, a big example of using, appropriating something, you know, without, um, uh, and then certainly you know, like twisting, you know, the, certainly the meaning that originally was behind it. Um, so yeah, that it can sometimes can go, you know, fully really go sideways. I think another one, and it's not so uh, historically loaded, is like the Zia symbol, which everybody's familiar with in New Mexico. That originated from the Pueblo of Zia, and obviously it's everywhere, all over official New Mexico state, you know, everything. Um, however, I did notice recently that the Pueblo of Zia has started licensing that image yes. to several different companies. There's one called Oregon Mountain Outfitters out of Las Cruces, and they are officially licensed by the Pueblo of Zia, all proceeds from their, um, uh, so that's a great example. I think the proceeds go to supporting educational um, uh, initiatives at the Pueblo of Zia. So that's a great example, I think, of a, of a company kind of responsibly appropriating that symbol, but in a consensual way. Yes, the woman who designed the Mexico state flag, which actually is a good one because mm -hmm. Not just like putting the seal and then putting it on a flag, which becomes unreadable. It's very really small. But um, the um, she used this one uh, Zia pot as inspiration on it, and uh, that seemed that yeah. So it literally did come from a Zia piece. Okay, so uh, we got about five minutes left, I think, before we need to go to Q and A. So I'd like to give you guys an opportunity for some concluding thoughts. Um, about the topic and hit on any of the things we didn't talk. We didn't get to talk about galleries and consumers' responsibilities when selling and purchasing indigenous art, uh, or, or you know who's harmed by the use or misuse of native imagery and art. So you can touch on any of those or any other concluding thoughts that you may have for the program today, and then we'll go to some Q and A. Tony. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh gosh, I'm gonna have to go for another kind of like way out there example. Um, are any familiar with this? This one, um, uh, he was a singer songwriter, um, Solomon Linda. He was uh, um, from South Africa. Um, way back when he recorded with his group a song called Mbube. And it's largely um, using vocables, and at the very end, he does this falsetto leap, right when the record's ending, that the world was forever known as the lyrics the, the lyrics would go in the jungle, the mighty jungle, the lion sleeps tonight. Um, and so this record, you know, got some play, um, but he eventually, you know, he died, um, you know, largely unknown, and um, and then I'm um, certainly you know, struggled financially most of his life. And uh, but the record made in this region, and then I think it was uh, Pete Seeger's group did a version of it. That again, because they didn't quite understand the. What it was saying, they called it a Wimoe. Oh, yeah. And then um, even um, also uh, the late Alan Arkin had a folk group. They did another, really, I guess, a very nice version of that as well, Wimoe. And I guess what Seeger would do, he would actually, because again, they didn't know who wrote it, and they just had that like scratchy record. So then he would like to save money aside for royalties, even though he didn't know where they were going to. And then he probably, even though it wasn't even required to do that as well because they changed it enough, what is it, like 10%, you know, to make it a new composition. Um, so then, then the, it becomes that, you know, quote unquote, rock and roll song, you know, with full lyrics and whatnot. And then The Lion King comes out as well, it becomes even more popular, just making all this money for the original songwriters, you know, but not for Solomon Linda or his estate, until someone finally figures it out. And then, like, <laughs> then, then they realize it too, that this is his, Composition is this is recording, so they are trying to work through courts, you know, but they were saying you know nothing, too much time has passed. But finally, people start to realize you know there's a responsibility to this, you know, certainly coming from the, other artists have responsibility to other artists as well. So they start, you know, again this this the, the company starts building this these record about labels, you know, they're forcing them to like you know, you, you got to build up these royalties, and then overnight, then they're like their their accounts get deposited, like this is through wire transfer, so it's back, you know, as fast. <laughs> Um, their their whole situation changes overnight because people realize you know what was the most responsible you know you can call it the right thing certainly responsible well, ethical but basically recognizing an artist's work. Thanks, Tony. That's a great example. Susan, some final thoughts. I really don't have anything more to say to okay. you about that. <laughs> Jay. 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, like to what Tony said, you know, to do the right thing of what, what is in the best interest of who you're borrowing from, who you're appropriating, who you're stealing from, however you define it, really. So I think that has a lot to do with it. And, um, you know, of having some in the know. The fact that we know who his name is now and, you know, the family, maybe he didn't have the time to appreciate, you know, his newfound wealth from the appreciation for his work, but you know, his family did. And sometimes those are some of those things too, as, as we work, you know, this is to benefit our family too as well. Again, that power dynamic of how, do you, how does it benefit, you know, our communities? How does it benefit our families? How does it benefit the individual? But then also, how does it benefit our, our communities in the future as well? Of like that of Zia Pueblo, um, creating or you know going to court getting the licensing trademarking it saying this is ours you have to pay us or um, reimburse us however you, you're compensating us and then them putting it towards their education program or their scholarship program so i think those are a lot of those things too and um you know i think that's again just do the right thing what's in your heart what's in your mind so Great, thanks. And your pocketbook. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so we do have a couple of wrap-up poll questions. Kelly, you want to bring those up on the screen? First question, this panel discussion increased my understanding of cultural appropriation. It looks like we did pretty good. <laughs> well, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, it's not bad. Great, you want to bring up the second one? This panel of discussion increased my knowledge of how to buy native art. So again, we didn't get yeah, we too didn't much, we didn't really get into that discussion about, about the responsibilities of galleries and consumers. Uh, but again, I urge you to go and um, watch the first panel, which really, really did focus on galleries and consumers' responsibilities when it comes to, if you're interested in, in purchasing authentic, legitimate indigenous art, um, there's legislation that protects you, protects the, the artist, protects the consumers as well. And so that so much, it wasn't so much the focus here, um, but you know, I think going to art markets is great, you know, you know meeting those artists face to face, is, is that's really, I think, you know, it, it not only really assures you as a consumer that you're purchasing a piece of legitimate native art, but then you have the opportunity to build a relationship with that artist and learn about the community that that artist is coming from. Learn something about the artist's family. And then, you know, a lot of these artists, they go to the markets year after year after year and you be able to really build a relationship, which to me is a much more valuable um, experience than having a pretty piece of jewelry, right? Um, is, is that um, that connection with um, a member of, of another community, of another culture. So, I was say, I'll, go ahead. I'll give a quick adding to that. So I know, uh, you know, probably the best place is a source, of going to the native artists, Pueblo artists. Um, I know the Museum of Northern Arizona has a show, I believe, in the summertime. Mm -hmm. I know you have different shows like the Zuni, Hopi, Navajo show. Yeah. And then uh, now there's just one. I believe it's in July. Is that correct? It's uh, June 20, June 22nd. June 22nd. Yeah, so check out that uh, first week in March. The Herd Museum will be having their show, and I'll be there. Tony will be there as well too. Uh, and other Native artists, especially many here in Arizona, uh, Santa Fe Indian Market, uh, put on by Swaya, is happening August 19th, uh, 20th, in that weekend. Then there's also another show, uh, The Pathways, by the uh, Pole Cultural Art Museum that's happening in Milwaukee, Buffalo Thunder. There's also Free Indian Market, as they call it, uh, happening in Santa Fe. And then there's also some really great galleries here in the state as well, too, that you know they really worked with a lot of the artists and you know they compensate them well, they're not taking advantage. But then there are also other ones that are not. So, <laughs> and, and we can probably name a couple. <laughs> well, let me, let me name another legitimate one. Uh, um, if you don't want to come out for the August prices as well, but you can come to Santa Fe for Memorial Day weekend for Native Treasures at the Santa Fe Convention Center. 
which the benefits the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. Yes, another <laughs> nice plug right there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So lots of opportunities to um, to not only purchase legitimate native art, but also build connections and relations. Yes, Susan. Um, Mark Sublet, who has Medicine Man Gallery, and mm -hmm. uh, used to be in Santa Fe, but he's in Tucson now. And uh, every day on Instagram, he talks about a different piece of pottery or a different basket. And he really is an expert about native art. <laughs> so if you ever get to Tucson and, and uh, go in his gallery, you'll be amazed. So that's another good source. Okay, we're gonna leave it there, but we'll hang around for a little while. Uh, we could, I think, talk about this the rest of the day. But uh, thank you all so very much for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, don't forget the reflection pages um, on your way out. A uh, quick thank you to Corey Begay, who is the Navajo artist who developed the page. And um, uh, thank you all again.